In Chapter 12, we're going to learn about tests of statistical significance, and there's a lot of um, new terminology in this chapter, so um, let's just take a look at some questions that you might think about when you collect information or data. What's the probability that a particular finding arose by chance? And this really requires us to use tests of statistical significance. How strong is that relationship, especially between an independent and a dependent variable? And this might require some measures of association, um, correlation, regression. So inferential statistics allows an investigator to infer a population characteristic from a sample. And you have to use a probability sample. The sample has to be representative of the population. With sample data, we can state the probability that a parameter falls within a specified range that we call a confidence interval. Another use of inferential statistics is to learn the probability that the observed relationship could have occurred if the variables were randomly related in the population. If the relationship between the variables is statistically significant, it doesn't mean that it's strong or important. And also, we need to understand whether or not there's practical significance to what we've identified. Statistical significance simply tells us something about the statistical relationship. How unusual is it? And large samples often lend to statistical support to trivial relationships. So how do we determine statistical significance? In your book, we're going to use four steps. We're going to identify or state the null and alternative or the null and research hypothesis, select the alpha level, select and compute a test statistic, and then make a decision. And there's a little graphic from your book that's nice to help you see that. Strict adherence to these steps may not be appropriate in all social science research. The steps may provide evidence that supports a hypothesis but might be inadequate for making a final decision about whether or not to reject the hypothesis. You might need more information um, to actually say, I reject the hypothesis. So hypothesis states some kind of a relationship between two variables, and the research hypothesis, or sometimes called alternative hypothesis, is the one the researcher is studying. The null spot usually postulates no relationship or a random relationship between the same variables described in the research hypothesis. And usually we use H sub O as the null and H1 or HA as the research hypothesis. So here's some examples of hypotheses, a research hypothesis. Some job training programs are more successful than other programs in placing employees or trainees in permanent employment. The null would be that they're all the programs are equally likely. There's another research hypothesis. Male planners earn higher salaries than females. What's a reasonable null there? That they gender is not related, or the males and the females earn the same salaries. To prove a hypothesis is true, we need two types of evidence. Confirming, which is based on inductive, and disconfirming, which is based on deductive. Generally, the evidence will support or fail to support the hypothesis rather than directly supporting the research hypothesis. Because really what we set out to do is really prove or disprove the null. Data are collected and examined to see if the results are consistent or inconsistent with the null. So when we do a hypothesis test, we can actually make a mistake. And we don't know that we've made that mistake, which is why it's critical to think about the effects of the mistakes. So a type 1 error is when we reject a true null. The data leads us to believe the research hypothesis when, in fact, the null is actually true. And a type 2 is failing to reject a false null. Data fails to alert the researcher that the research hypothesis is true. And there's a little summary table from your book. And the alpha level is what we determine as a criterion for rejecting a null hypothesis. It's called, it's a probability value, and it's the, I call it the alpha level. And common levels used are 0 .01, 0 .05, 0 .001. Alpha level is the probability of committing a type 1 R. And the al alpha level is actually a conditional probability. It's the probability of getting what we got uh, given the null was true. So for instance, if the alpha level is 0 .05, there's a 5% chance that we would in fact reject the null when in fact it's true. And the power is related to the alpha level. This is the probability that a test of significance results in rejection of a false null. It's designated by Greek letter beta, typed probability the type 2. The power is actually 1 minus beta. And alpha and beta are inversely related. If we decrease the alpha, the beta will increase and the power will decrease. Selecting the alpha level, again, depends on the consequences of what's more critical to committing a type 1 or a type 2 error. So your book has a nice example to try to illustrate this. So the research hypothesis in this case is that gamma cars are less safe than other cars. 
and the null is that they're the safe as other, other cars. So you have an opportunity to buy a gamma car for a good price. You collect accident data and you decide that the gamma cars you make a type 1 are, are less safe when in fact they're just as safe as any other car. Practical implication. You miss out on a bargain because you decide not to buy the car because you've concluded that the cars are less safe. Alright, let's say with the same example. Now let's say that you make a type 2 error. You conclude the cars are as safe when in fact they're not. What's the practical implication here? You borrow a car that's less safe and may lead to a serious injury uh, that could have been avoided. So what do you do? What would you do? Generally in this case you probably would want to minimize the probability of committing the type 2 error because the safety of the car is probably more important than getting a good bargain on the car. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. All right, so testing significance. Um, there are four things to think about. The alpha level, the power, the sample size, and then also how large of an effect do you want to detect. So a small effect is unlikely to be detected with a small sample size and a small alpha level. One could increase the alpha level, but that would increase the probability of a type 1 error and decrease the probability of a type 2 error. Increasing the sample size will decrease both types of errors, but of course in many cases we can increase the sample size because it's related to a cost factor or possibly a time factor. Alright, so we're going to talk about chi-square statistic, which is used for nominal level data and often used to analyze contingency tables. And then next week we'll talk about t-tests, which examine the differences between means or simply um, to test of a single mean. And we're looking here at an interval dependent variable and a nominal independent variable. So this week we'll focus on the chi-square. So this compares the observations contained in a data set with what we would expect to see if there was no relationship or there was a random relationship between the variables in the population. Provides the probability that in the population the variables are unrelated, but it doesn't indicate the direction of the relationship. So your book has a nice example here, um, looking at training, current status by the type of training um, program attended. And so we had three statuses, working, still in school, or unemployed. And then we have three kinds of training programs, vocational, on-the-job training, and work skills training. We notice overall 49, almost 50% of all subjects are working, but there was no association between work status and program categories. We would expect to see about 50% in each of the categories here. But when we do those calculations, we see in the vocational ed it's down to 30%, on-the-job training about 40%, job skills much higher, almost 66%. And what we look at when we do the chi-square is we actually calculate what are called the expected cell counts and we compare what we observed to what we expected. To find the expected, you take the row total times the column total and divide by the overall. So for the working vocational ed, we take 292 times 64 divided by 586 and we come up with that 31.9. And what the chi-square statistic actually does is take the difference between the observed and expected, squares it, and divides by the expected as a way to standardize it in order to get the chi-square calculation. And so here's the calculation. So for each table, each um, cell in the table, we take the frequency observed minus the frequency expected, square it, divide by the expected, and add that up, those up over all the cells in the table. And in this job training program, if you do those calculations, you come out with a chi-square statistic of 50.57. And there are degrees of freedom associated with a chi-square statistic, and they're equal to the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. And the calculated chi-square is then compared to a tabled value based on the degrees of freedom. If the chi-square that we calculated exceeds the tabled value, associated with the alpha level, we report it as statistically significant. So in the job training program, it was a 3 by 3 table, so it has 4 degrees of freedom. And from the table uh, for a chi-square, we see 4 degrees of freedom. The critical value for a p-value of 05 is 9.488. Ours is much larger than that, so therefore the p-value is uh, less than 0.001, and we say that it has statistical significance. We reject the null. There is some kind of a relationship between job training and employment status. So it's a statistic, the chi-square statistic for variables measured at the nominal level, it doesn't tell us anything about the direction of the relationship. The numerical value of the chi-square tends to increase as the sample size increases. Therefore, a larger chi-square is more likely to be statistically significant even if there isn't practical significance. 
does not reliably estimate the probability of a type 1 error if we have any expected cell counts less than 5. So let's go back to the job training problem again to set out the steps. So here's the hypothesis. Some training programs are more successful than others in placing trainees in permanent employment. The null is that they're all the same. Alpha level we selected was 05. We did a chi-square because we have nominal data. We got the test statistic. We compared it to the alpha level criterion. And we concluded that um, some job training programs are more successful. But again, I remind you that we can't tell which one because there's no direction associated with the chi-square. We can only say they're, they're not the same. Their they're placement levels are not the same. So in summary, tests of significance allow a researcher to determine the probability that variables are related related in a random sample are not related in the population. There's four steps we're going to use, and we talked about two types of error. This week we went over the chi-square. Next week we'll go over the t-statistic.